Here is an overview of the dystopian short story The Pedestrian by Ray Bradbury. The where, the when, the what and the who. Where. This powerful short story's action is set in a large unnamed city, a city of three million, in an unnamed dystopian society. Dystopian is an adjective used to describe an imaginary state or society in which the public are exposed to suffering and or injustice and where information, independent thought and freedom are restricted. The population is generally subject to constant supervision and the people live in fear, often of, an, of a powerful authoritarian figure or even of each other. The city is described as being in a poor state of repair, with a buckling concrete pavement which is punctuated by grassy seams, suggesting a lack of use by the inhabitants of the city, while the streets are described as a thunderous surge of cars during the daytime, but in the evening as dry riverbeds. There are repeated references to the silence of these empty streets and the lonely protagonist's experience of walking past the tomb-like houses is compared to walking through a graveyard. We learn that in ten years of walking by night or day for thousands of miles, the protagonist has never met another person walking, not one in all that time. Equally alarmingly, as the story progresses, we learn that there is only one police car left in this huge, highly populated city, because crime is ebbing, which means going down. So the authorities have been able to cut from three to one police car after the elections the previous year. The mention of this solitary police car, along with the references to scarab beetle cars in the daytime, plus the viewing screens and air conditioning, which keep people confined to their houses in the evenings, suggests that impersonal, emotionless technology dominates every aspect of life in this dystopian society. When? The Pedestrian is set in a futuristic society in 2053, and the story was written around 1951, when technology such as motor cars and the first televisions were becoming more popular in society. The author of The Pedestrian, Ray Bradbury, was thus prophesying what life might be like in a hundred years' time, as technology continued to develop. If we think how close 2053 now is, a mere 30 years at time of filming, and consider how much of what he predicted could be said to have already come true, for example, the amount of time that many people spend in front of screens, and the way in which the relationship between humans and nature has been eroded, Bradbury wasn't too far off the mark. What? In this story, Bradbury explores four key themes. The first is non-conformity versus conformity. Non-conformity is portrayed or symbolised by the defiant walker, the pedestrian of the title, while conformity is illustrated by the people who only venture out of their houses by day to work, but remain glued to intellectually unstimulating TV shows by night. The second theme is technology and the dehumanisation that it can cause within society, as demonstrated by the TV screens, which everyone apart from Leonard Mead appears to have been brainwashed into watching constantly rather than connecting with their fellow human beings. This dehumanisation is also demonstrated very clearly by the sinister police car. The third theme is isolation, clearly presented by the lone pedestrian who appears to have little to no communication with other citizens and merely whispers to the houses as he passes. As he walks, his shadow is described as moving like the shadow of a hawk in mid-country, the imagery of hawks being effective in emphasising Leonard's loneliness as hawks are solitary hunters. This is further highlighted by the fact that he has only dry riverbeds, the streets for company. Even the police car, with its metallic voice, does not contain a human being and merely emits mechanical sounds such as a humming and a faint whirring click. The fourth theme explored by Bradbury in the story is nature versus the city. The references to technology are negative in tone. For example, the mindless nature of the TV programmes on Channel 4, Channel 7, Channel 9 and the thunderous surge of cars in the daytime, the hostile headlight of the police car which held him fixed like a museum specimen, needle thrust through chest. The robotic car is also portrayed negatively as smelling of riveted steel and harsh antiseptic, emphasising the lack of humanity in this dystopian society. By contrast, evocative, positive language is used to reference nature, such as the simile describing Leonard's lungs as blazing like a Christmas tree, 
when out in the fresh, cold air, and the vivid word choice to describe the rusty smell that he inhales as he picks up the leaves. Another example of positive language with regard to nature is the sibilance that draws our attention to Leonard's satisfaction at the sound of the faint push of his soft shoes through autumn leaves. Evidently, he enjoys and values the natural world and being outside experiencing it. Hence, his explanation to the police car of his purpose for leaving his house each night and walking, for air, and to see, and just to walk. From the police car's disapproving, uncomprehending and clinical response, it is clear that Leonard's attitude to nature contrasts dramatically with the expectations of this dystopian, technologically controlled society in which he is unfortunate enough to live. Who? Leonard Mead. Bradbury's protagonist, the main character, in this short story is the eponymous, which means mentioned in the title, pedestrian Leonard Mead, who lives in a brightly lit house and walks the streets of the city for miles each night, pausing to appreciate nature as he does and taking care to wear sneakers so the neighbourhood dogs don't bark as he passes. The bright lights in Leonard's home, every window a loud yellow illumination, symbolise that he is intellectually enlightened, emotionally alive, and is a warm, vibrant soul, unlike the others who live in this city. We learn during his interrogation by the accusatory police car that Leonard is a writer, although that is ironically considered by the robotic car to be no profession. It emerges that there is no requirement for writers, when we learn that there have been no publications for some time in this dystopian society, where people are instead fed uninspiring TV programmes on their viewing screens. Leonard, on the other hand, has no viewing screen at his home, a fact that upsets the police car. It is also displeased by his revelation that he has been walking every night simply to experience the fresh air, even though he has air conditioning in his house. This is seen as deviant behaviour by the controlling car. The stark difference between Leonard's behaviour and that of the other three million or so inhabitants of the city that singles him out as non-conformist and possibly even a threat to social order in the eyes of the authorities. When, having reluctantly got in to the car, he is driven away to the Psychiatric Centre for Research on Regressive Tendencies. The reader suspects that by the time he leaves this establishment, Leonard will be reduced to the same state as the others. The ending of the story engages the reader's sympathy for Leonard and his inevitable fate, while reminding us of the dangers of a society that becomes too reliant on technology. Don't say Bradbury didn't warn us. The robotic police car. Of course, the car is not technically a character in the usual sense of the word. Indeed, the whole point of the story is that this sinister vehicle with a metallic voice lacks humanity and is a threat to Leonard's freedom, as it will inevitably force him to conform by taking him to the centre. The car is devoid of compassion, and its ability to control over three million citizens accentuates not only how impersonal modern technology is, but also how potentially dangerous. By empowering our technological inventions and enabling them to take over an increasing number of tasks from humans, we are running a very real risk. In Bradbury's opinion, when he was writing this story back in 1951, that risk was that one day technology could threaten the very aspects of our life that makes our society human. And what is particularly thought-provoking about the story, viewed from a present-day perspective, is how much our lives are already governed by technology and robots, such as the car. The other inhabitants of the city. As mentioned previously, everyone else who lives in the vast metropolis where this short story is set is very different from Leonard Mead, creating an interesting but increasingly alarming contrast. The pedestrian is thus a thought-provoking exploration of the theme of the impact of technology on humanity and specifically the risk that it might one day completely take over and control the human race. The story gives the reader a chilling insight into how the excessive use of technology can dehumanise society. Whereas the protagonist, Leonard, walks the streets each night, all the other brainwashed members of this depressingly restrictive society spend their non-working hours glued to intellectually unstimulating and uninformative programmes on their viewing screens. A dozen assorted murders, a quiz, a review, a comedian falling off the stage, all the while breathing in artificially conditioned air. 
This, of course, ensures that the populace does not socialise, apart from at work, and has no access to current affairs. Put bluntly, the other citizens are being manipulated and controlled by the authorities and robbed of their freedom. The contrast between Leonard's house and the rest of the city is emphasised by its description in the closing lines of the story as one house in an entire city of houses that were dark. This, in turn, highlights the contrast between the pedestrian and the other three million sedentary inhabitants, and we feel concerned that he, the last inhabitant to stay in touch with nature, will soon be consigned to living indoors in a dark house with only grey phantoms on the walls for company. So while Leonard is initially a free bird, as indicated by the imagery comparing him to a hawk, by the end of the story he is incarcerated in a little black jail with bars, like a caged bird. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you found it useful. See you next time. In other videos on The Pedestrian, we look at key themes and key quotes from the story. If you found this or any of our other videos useful, it would be great if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thanks for your support.